Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to the Business Lounge Podcast. I'm your host, Jess Cassidy, and today we have a special guest. We have Juliana, who is the co-founder of Two Mama Bees, and oh my gosh, you guys are going to go crazy when we learn everything about what these two ladies have done. So I don't want to give it all away. Let's just jump right into it. Hey, Juliana, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Let's just dive right into all of this and tell me more about Two Mama Bees, because I know that you guys turned a backyard Etsy store business, basically, into an eight-time award-winning manufacturing company now sold in over 110 retail stores, and those include Target, Walmart, Wayfair, Saks Fifth Avenue, Sam's Club, and FAO Schwartz. Yes. Um, So actually, since I think we last spoke, we're actually now a 12-time award-winning manufacturing company. So we just found out that we won Toy of the Year by Best Products for our London Swing Set. So we're super excited for that one. Probably one of the biggest awards that you can um, win in the toy industry. So that was really great recognition. Um, But yeah, so... Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're also up for two more Stevie Awards for the American Business Awards, Women in Business for Sustainability and Best Small Business. So we are very excited to find out what we win. We're either gold, silver, bronze. We find out on November 8th. Yeah. Wow. Fingers crossed. Yeah. (laughs) But all good. Even I'll take a bronze because they have so many people. That's worldwide. So I think they had like 15,000 applications. So either way, we're in great company. That's amazing. That's a huge accolades to you guys. So tell us a little bit about this business, how you guys got started. Like, how did this even come about? So, yeah, it really is just such an organic kind of story where it just came from two best friends um, who were just kind of looking for something to do on the side. My business partner and co-founder um, has at the time had three children. Now between the two of us, we have eight. But at the time she had three, her son was born and diagnosed with autism. And um, I think that's a re- it was really difficult mostly for her because she didn't know what role she fit in as a mom anymore. You know, she had therapists in and out of the house sometimes for six to eight hours a day. And it was like, the therapists were doing all the momming and she was like, where do they stop and where do I start? And so she felt very disconnected um, from a role that should feel very natural to you. And so her husband kind of just said, you know, Sam is like, becoming like withdrawn. And I'm sure there was some depression there as well. You know, maybe if she just makes like a hundred dollars a week, something that makes her feel like it's hers again, she'll feel good. And so, I mean, like our running joke is always like how that hundred dollars go, but, um, we really just started by, we built some window boxes and we built stuff strictly for our own homes. And then we would take pictures of it on our own houses. Um, and, put it on the Etsy shop. And if anybody wanted to buy it, then that weekend we would like get together and, you know, drink wine and use power tools because that's really (laughs) intelligent. And um, we would ship it. And she had redone her backyard and she had one of our competitors. Everybody knows like the brown, like not so aesthetically pretty playhouses in her backyard. And it just didn't fit the vibe. So we were like, let's paint it. And it turned out so cute. We're like, we should throw it up on our Etsy shop. We had no idea how we'd ship it, like <laughs> no clue what we would do. And so really just like, like I said, very organic <laughs> along the way. Um, but yeah, within one year, we had almost a thousand sales. So we were like, okay, we're definitely on to something. I quit my corporate America job and um, went full time. So it went from Samantha's backyard to my backyard, one warehouse, two warehouses, and all in the background. We were really 
um, working to create our own brand. And we call those years like our market research years because it's such a different experience with Etsy buyers. They communicate on such like a personal level because you feel like you're just buying from a friend, right? Um, so they would give us like this profound feedback. Like I love this aspect, but I didn't like this. So we took all of that feedback in and we designed and developed our own line of playhouses that launched in October of 2021. It's been just an incredible whirlwind experience. And I think it's one thing to say, like, you've built something, but like to be able to build it with your best friend, with all your babies watching, it's just, it's so incredible. And we're so proud of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, We are manufactured in America by second generation Amish artisans. Um, We're sustainably sourced from managed forests. So we really like, when we decided to do this, we were like, we're going to go two feet in and we're going to do it exactly the right way, exactly the way that we would want to purchase a product. That's what we're going to create. And if the market's receptive, it's receptive. And so far it has been, and that's just even more rewarding. Yeah, because you guys totally found like a very specific niche of buyers for your product, which is amazing. Yes. Yes, we did. I feel like we like really niched down to say, and now we're branching out a bit more now that we've like really hit some traction in the market. Um, like our London that just won toy of the year. It's, it's sold for, uh, 2450, which is a really like middle of the line price point. It's very comparable to what a lot of our competitors are doing on like the higher or low price range. So I feel like now we're really hitting just the ground running with being able to create products that we know will resonate with consumers, um, not only quality wise, but also price point wise. And so that's great. Now, now we're able to like do a bit more, create products, kind of reverse engineer them to really make them like geared towards the masses instead of just such a small niche group. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure that Um, you know, starting out with Etsy, like you said, having that feedback and everything really helped you to take over the market like you did instead of jumping right into the market and not having that background and, you know, confidence. Yeah, I really, I I agree with that completely. And there's some products that we created that Sam and I thought were going to be home runs. We're like, there's no way people won't love this. Our kids love it. It's set up in our own homes, but that's just not how the consumer product industry works. The market tells you what they like. You don't get to tell it. So, you know, we really like dive heavy into feedback. Like we still try to stay extremely involved with our customers, communicating with them directly. Like I still answer like messages, DMs on Instagram directly because I want to hear what their feedback is. Like I, I think it's invaluable. I think that a lot of times brands, especially when they've been around for 30, 40, 50, and that's really what our you know, like our competition is, they become like a shell of a corporation where they're just pumping out mass products and they're not listening to the market. They're not trying to engage with the market to really understand what the market wants and their wishes are. So I think that's what sets us apart is like, we've been able to be in these big retail stores like Target and Walmart and Sam's Club, but still keep those like family-based values. Um, And obviously the craftsmanship and construction is top tier, you know, that you don't make them better than ours. So just to give you an example, our rain two story playhouse, it weighs 535 pounds compared to our competitors of the same size weighs roughly 250 pounds. And that's just based on the quality of the wood alone. So like, we're really creating products that like one day you watch your kids play on it and then you watch your grandkids play on the exact same swing set later on. And it's those like powerful memories that I think last a lifetime. Like, you know, my grandmother, she still has this uh, dollhouse in her basement that I played on when I was a kid. And now when we go to her house, my kids go rushing down the stairs. It's the first thing that they want to play with is this dollhouse that I could, you could line up any one of my cousins in the family and we would all remember it. We would all used to talk about it. It was the most beautiful dollhouse. And it, it's the heirloom construction, right? There's nothing wrong with it. I can't even believe it. It's probably 40, 50 grandkids have played with this thing and it's still beautiful and in perfect condition. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. I love that heirloom, you know, 
thought process behind it of it just lasting for generations and generations. So since you guys, you know, obviously grew so fast in, you know, a really short amount of time and you guys are both working mothers, how do you guys balance, you know, the work and the life aspect and, you know, like how, how many people do you have on your team and your business and stuff now? So I, I, I really try to stress the fact that everything comes in seasons. And if you're a mom, then you would totally understand that, right? Like you have your infant season and that's all hands on deck. And no, you can't look away for a second. And you don't want to look away for a second, right? You want to soak up every minute because every day, like you like feel like they're growing like exponentially. You're like, holy cow, like a week ago you were wearing a newborn diaper and now all of a sudden you're like three to 16. I have three kids. Samantha has five. So, you know, we've walked watch that growth throughout the years. And it's the same thing with your business, right? There are just seasons. And so when we first started, we were at Etsy shop. It really was, we were like in our infant stage and we couldn't look away for a second. Um, Sam and I were actually pregnant at the same time and gave birth in 2019, a day apart to little girls. Um, yeah, we call them our baby bees, but we were back in the warehouses within 48 hours and our girls were in the front of the warehouse with Sam's husband, <laughs> real rock star. And he would just like pick up the phone and call us in the back and be like, Vivi's hungry or rain is hungry. And one of us would run off to feed him and then run back to work. And it was, it was difficult, but it was a season and that season, our business really needed us. And now you're right. Now we have established a team and like, as the business has grown, we've been able to like take things off our own plate, um, and put them on to other more qualified people's plates because as a CEO or Samantha, as a COO, we cannot wear every hat, you know, and we're not the best fit for every role either. We are very aware of that. So, I would say now in-house, our team is made up of roughly like five to six people, but um, through like our manufacturing facilities, at least 50 to 60. So it's a large team, but we have a lot of people that oversee different departments um, that talk to us. And we've been able to streamline that even more to consolidate. So a lot of people talk to people underneath people. And then it's like, that's how you are able to have time to do things like this instead of sitting on the phone with 70 people a day. Um, but I would say um, the biggest benefit in that is the fact that it's given us the ability to be more flexible with our schedule. So Samantha and I pick our kids up from school every single day. Um, so go to every sporting event, everything is scheduled in our phones and worked around in that way that we're able to prioritize what's important to us. And right now being mothers is extremely important to us. Running this business is equally as important, but we've been able to now find a way to balance both. But before we weren't, are you kidding me? We were not balancing both when we have infants sitting in the front of a warehouse and we're hand painting playhouses for 16 hours a day in the back. I mean, we were working on Christmas Eve until almost midnight and then we had to go play Santa. You know, it's, there was no balance then. Now there is. Yeah. And I think, you know, what you said earlier was so important about, you know, that infancy stage, because no matter what type of business it is, when you first start that, like you're the one wearing all the hats, you have to do everything. You don't have the money coming in. You don't have the systems, the processes, the team, nothing. And it doesn't matter what type of business that is. Everybody, you know, starts that way. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I think that's probably where a lot of people end too because they are not mentally prepared for the workload. Um, and, you know, that's where you get kind of set apart from the rest. Like if you can handle the stress and you can handle the workload and you can get through those early years, um, you're probably set up for the long run because it only gets better from there, Lord willing, at least. Yeah, and I think too that it's really hard for people, you know, when they go from, you know, being a solopreneur and wearing all of the hats to finding the right time to bring somebody else on because most people either, you know, they want to bring people on before they're making any money and then, you know, they're burdening that extra expense or they don't want to bring anybody on because they don't want to train them. They don't want to give up stuff. And you're right. I think that's why a lot of people fall off right there. 
because mm-hmm. they they lack, you know, the the skills, the mindset, the intention of seeing the bigger picture of being able to move forward sometimes. Yeah. And exactly what you just said too. It sometimes it's just the timing, right? If you're not able to calculate that timing correctly, like how you phrased it, that, you know, sometimes you want to do it too soon. And sometimes maybe you miss the boat on it and you should have done it sooner because it could have think marketing, for instance, like if you don't hire a marketing team in the correct amount of time, then you're probably missing out on sales. Other businesses could come and capitalize. So it is a timing, you know, it's all, it's a, it's a lot, but it's a huge juggling act. Um, and, a lot of it just comes to, you know, your, your instincts. I mean, we're women, we're very instinctual, just beings in general. So, you know, when it feels like the overload is there, when it feels like the orders are coming in too much, that's probably the perfect timing to hire somebody for marketing. And once the marketing team is in, they should be making enough money to pay themselves and then some. So the profit comes on the back end. I think that was our, that was our big first step was hiring marketing team, building out our marketing team. And then from there also hiring like a CFO to oversee because listen, financials, that is not something you ever want to make a misstep on. I tell like my CEO and my tax guy all the time. I'm like, my biggest fear in life is accidental tax evasion. So let's just always err on the side of caution. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a numbers person at all. So I don't like to look at that. It doesn't make sense to me, but I definitely don't want to get in trouble about it either. (laughs) Right. And knowing that, right. Like you just said it right there, like knowing your strengths and weaknesses, like making sure you check your ego at the door, because that's another thing, right? As CEOs, sometimes we all like are like, oh, I can do it all. And I did it all for all those years, but did I do it better than they could do it? Probably not. So there's your ego check right there. And now it seems to be a lot faster and more streamlined. So I guess I wasn't doing it as efficiently, right? So yeah. Yeah. And as you know, an owner of a business and stuff like your main job is to be like the thought leader, you know, envision everything before and lead people to the future and not spend time on the stuff that you're not very good at for sure. And you can't be good at everything. Nobody can. Yeah, exactly. Work on the business and not in the business. So, and that's, that's where a lot of people get really stuck and, you know, Mm -hmm. we all do it too. Still sometimes I'm sure as well. Um, oh yeah. You brought up, you know, marketing a lot. And I want to talk a little bit about, you know, building you guys' brand and brand authority because obviously, you know, that must have had a huge part in, you know, how quickly you grew. So what were you guys doing? Like, how did you guys work on your brand? Get yourself out there in that marketing stuff before you brought on somebody to take over marketing for you. So I will, I will just be completely transparent. We have still to this day, never spent a single dollar on any ad spend. So, um, but we had a plan going into year one. So October of 2021, we were launching, we had one retailer that we knew we were launching through because we had already been in discussions with them prior. Um, And from there, a lot of it did, come to us. So I, I hate, to, I don't want to like lead people down the round path and be like, you better do this. No, I, I'm not going to gatekeep. Like I would say the majority of the retailers that we work with came to us, but that was really because we did the market research in those early years to see what the market was lacking to figure out what would work best. And so we got really I wouldn't say lucky in that way, but there was there was probably some luck to it along with a lot of due diligence on the front end, right? Um, as far as getting into retailers and what our plan was, well, we knew nothing we were doing was proprietary. I cannot get a patent on the fact that I make really pretty white playhouses. Yeah. You know, of, of course, nobody can copy my playhouses exactly, um, but they could still make other white playhouses and see how they sell. And they do. All of our competitors try to mimic our, our designs now, you know, but, um, I think year one, what we really wanted to lean heavy on was finding brands that really aligned with what our visions and goals were that we knew our competitors would never be sold in because that is the thing that sets us apart. So our, 
our value proposition really is the fact that we're made in America, that we have sustainability like plans, that we're using all eco conscious like wood and paint. We use low VOC. Like, so all of these value propositions that we knew aligned with what our brand did, that definitely doesn't align with what our competitors did. So there were a lot of like market space where nobody was selling playhouses. Um, I'll give you an example, Saks Fifth Avenue. They never sold a playhouse, but they have a whole kids section. And that aligned with our consumer base because our consumer base, especially when we very first started, was luxury. I mean, it still is. We are still a, definitely a luxury product. Um, no matter what price point you buy our product in, you're getting the exact same quality of luxury product. So when we were able to have conversations with companies like Saks Fifth Avenue, we knew that we were going to be already using their brand recognition to help solidify ourselves in the market. So when you buy something from Saks Fifth Avenue, you anticipate that the product you're buying is quality. They've taken 50 years to be able to create that consumer awareness and that consumer like thought process. I don't have 50 years to do that. I need to do it today so that I can build traction on my brand today. So by aligning ourselves with um, those kind of like niche retailers, they did a lot of the work legwork for us. So there was a plan in place. There was no guarantee that they would say yes to us. Thank God they did. Um, they're not able to carry all of our products because of weight constrictions. Um, but at the same time, they carry enough of our product line that we can use it when we market and we can, you know, reference it and consumers see it, you know, when they go on Saks and they're looking in the children's section, they see it. Or, you know, Mason and Ad is another great um partner that we've worked with. And we have a, a incredible relationship with Mason and Ed. And if you're buying luxury children's products, it's just a natural website to go to or one of their best sellers. So really like finding what your niche is and then do the market research, make sure, run some pre-sales. I always, anybody that I talk to that comes to me for like any advice, I'm like, a pre-sale is going to be your best friend because it's going to save you from bankruptcy on the back end. You are not going to ever, like I could love something more than anything in the world. I could say that it's the greatest product that I have. And that doesn't mean that everybody else in the world loves it as much as I do. So make sure that the world loves it way more than you do before you suddenly get yourself in bed with thousands of pieces of inventory because that's how you end up, you know, in a position that you don't want to be in because then you can't even sell it off and it's just lost money. Um, so yeah, so I would say really like streamline. And if you're able to let the retailers do that, do that legwork for you, let them tell the story that you want to tell uh, with their own brand recognition. So I absolutely love, 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 you know, how you said that you know, you were truthful, you were honest, and, you know, you were like everybody, they kind of reached out to you in the beginning. So, I mean, obviously that doesn't happen to everyone mostly, but how do you think that, you know, they found you, you know, was it your social media presence? Was it, you know, your SEO on your website and they were just, you know, searching for, you know, brands to bring in? Like, what was that key? Because obviously you guys had a lot of really great, you know, um, you found an, an amazing niche to be in there, that other, you know, place that companies were not in there. So they must have found you by something you were doing in those areas as well. Yeah, I would say the first retailer that we went in um, at the time was great. I'd name them, but they're not great anymore. <laughs> um, they've actually now since gone out of business. Um, but they were kind of like what was known for as like the eco-conscious online. I guess I could just name them. Uh, the Tot is the name of the, the company. I don't know if you or maybe some of your um, listeners would be familiar with it. Yes. So they were kind of like, are you familiar with the Tot? 
Yes. I, yeah. I've heard okay. Of before, yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought it was I mean, going to be Toys R Us or something because you know I know they. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the tot was the tot really was it was like luxury and it was everything was eco conscious, right? So and they were kind of like the company in the industry. So they were the ones that we first launched with, and I will tell you a lot of times what happens is it's going to be a domino effect. So the tot saw us, and then Mason and Ott saw us on the tot, and then from there. I couldn't even tell you how I know how Saks Fifth Avenue found us. It was from FAO Schwartz because we set up and did an install in FAO Schwartz summer shop. So, but I don't know how FAO Schwartz found us, I guess, just looking through different websites. I mean, no, did we have SEO? Absolutely not. Like we had no SEO. Our website was like so basic. Um, Our following on Instagram was maybe like 5,000. It was nothing. It's not even anything like that significant. Now I think we have like 14,000 followers maybe. So um, yeah, I don't want to lie to people. I mean, yes, like it would be great if we went viral. We would love to go viral now. And we work with great influencers now, but I think we just built upon the traction and I mean, we did, we did the hard work of really creating a brand that was not only beautiful, but then we did the hard work of making sure that our customer success story was extremely significant. We made sure that we were getting good reviews, that we were aligning ourselves with consumers in a way that they were, you know, talking about us and giving us referrals. I mean, I remember when we first started out, it was like so random, but we must have shipped 40 playhouses to like the same two cities in California. And we're like, what is going on in California? Do we need to fly out there like and see? But it's word of mouth, you know? And when you're creating a product that you can stand behind and be proud of, then, you know, your consumers will do the talking for you. And that's the that's the best route. That's the cheapest route to go right there is just by word of mouth referrals. Um, so I think it, it kind of like just, it, it was like the domino effect, right? So the tot started with us and then other people saw us on it and, you know, they're all looking and searching. So if you can get your foot in the door with one of the good and big ones that really align with your niche market, then trust me, there will be different ones to follow. Other ones will follow because they all look at each other's and they all want to see what everybody else is doing. And, oh, wow, you have this product. Well, I need to have it on my site because so FAO. Schwartz and Saks Fifth Avenue were one of the same. I know for a fact that our FAO Schwartz buyer directly called the Saks buyer and told her, you need to hear about this company. So those are ways that we did that. And then once we had our traction, once we had our footing, um, and I don't want to like tell people you should do this if you're not completely staged and set for um, mass consumer drop shipping. But we were, once we were at that stage, then we went and we found a big box brand rep, which they exist. There are a number of them. You can Google it and look them up. Um, We're personally repped by Bluebird Group, but there are some other really great ones. They're not even going to look at you though, if you don't have traction in the market. So it's not something to look into until you're really ready to show some real numbers, to show some success, and to also show them that you're staged and ready and your product's already shipping on its own because they want to know that they don't have to do a lot of the legwork on the back end, if that makes sense. Um, But that's how we got into Target was our big box brand rep. Wow. That's amazing. And I love, you know, that you guys, you know, obviously, you know, you found that niche, you were doing something right. And the buyers from those companies, you know, or their assistants or other people on their team and stuff, they were Googling, they were searching, they were listening, you know, to what the talk was. And, you know, they're always looking for the next, you know, up and coming or what they need to have in their store. So that's what it was. You guys were, you know, even if you were in the right place at the right time, you had that niche that differentiated you. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. So now that, you know, you have all of this, you know, amazing traction going on, you're in all these top tier luxury stores, what's the plan for the future? Where are you guys going to, you know, try and go? What's the plan? Well, we would love to branch out into Canada. Um, I think that's on our agenda for 2025. Um, And then go in stores, just make it even easier for consumers to buy our products. Um, It makes most sense with the size of our products to do like a Sam's Club or a Costco where they can actually see the product set up in person. 
when you see it, it, it sells itself because they are just so beautiful. Like they're stunning. And when you can see the thickness and the quality of wood, it's like nothing else on the market, unless you're literally buying a customized piece for 20 to $50,000. So, um, those are our goals. Um, those are kind of like the checklist of what we'd love to see happen for us in 2025 and bring more products to market. We're working on some really great, um, exciting products right now, uh, an indoor play gym. Um, we're also working on it. I don't know if you mentioned, but all of our products are named after our own children. Um, and we have yet to build a Makai, which is Samantha's son with autism. Um, and obviously he is the reason this brand all started. So a lot of thought has gone into what the Makai would look like. Um, so that is something that we're currently working on and we're actually working directly with industry professionals. So speech therapist, OT therapist, play therapist to help design and consult on the design work of the Makai. Um, a percentage of the proceeds will go back to autism awareness and there will be um, a plethora of sensory items that really are directly related to children that are on the spectrum or need sensory friendly play. Um, so that's kind of going to be a full circle moment for us, if you will, to be able to launch the Makai. So we're very excited about that too. Um, and we're using that same information that we're learning through these um, industry professionals and marketing materials. So we're actually in every box that you buy, if you were to buy like an air fryer, it says like, here's how you work it. And then it gives you a few recipe examples in the background. Um, we're doing the exact same thing with our instruction booklets, but coming from from directly from industry professionals where they say, here's different ways that you can engage in play with your child. Here's different ways that you can implement play utilizing our Aviana Play Kitchen, for instance, where your child is hitting these developmental milestones while they're working on this play. Um, so, you know, our mission is to empower families through purposeful play. And now we're really putting pen to paper about what that looks like. You know, what does empowering families look like? What does purposeful play look like for families? And how can families be engaged in play for longer? Um, so just trying to set up, stage that for growth and for our clients and customers to be able to learn and grow with us. It's amazing, you know, listening to you talk about your products and your company because you guys really are so different. You know, you don't just go one step above your competitors. It's, you know, 10, 15 steps above of what you guys offer and, you know, what you bring. So thank you for doing that for the world. Thank you. That's very sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> so tell everybody how they can find you guys and how they can join the mailing list to stay up to date on your catalog, you know, everything that you guys offer and everything new coming. Yes. So you can always find us at two mama bees.com. It's the number two and then mama M A M A bees like a bumblebee B E E S is in Sam.com. We're also two mama bees on all social media platforms, every single one of them. <laughs> um, and you know, you can sign up for our newsletter just directly on our website. You receive 10% off your first purchase in doing so. And we love to stay connected to our community. Like I said, I'm the one who always answers DMs. So if anybody has any questions or wants to learn more, I'm sure they could reach out to you or they could always reach out to me as well. Yes, absolutely. We'll have all of the links and everything in the episode. And I know that, you know, tons of people are going to be signing up just, you know, to keep up to date with everything, hopefully order some products. Um, but Juliana, thank you so much for joining me today. I loved listening to your story, the company, you know, how you guys got started and what you guys have in store for the future. It's incredible. I'm so proud to just listen to it all. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast or our YouTube channel, and we will see you guys next time.